Good morning, everybody. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here with all of you. It took a long time to prepare this kind of event, and finally, when you see uh, the room uh, full, and also uh, that uh, the important people uh, who are here is really, really a pleasure to to achieve this uh, this uh, outcome. As uh, Michael explained it uh, very well, uh, in this second part of the session, we invited uh, two experts coming from the research, uh, research field just for uh, introducing uh, the matters that are on the agenda at that moment at the level of research. And in doing this, uh, we thought that, uh, as it was commented previously, uh, as far as uh, policies regarding the criminal justice uh, arena are related with evidence, with results coming from uh, research, and we are all able to identify which are the key matters that uh, put it in place uh, may ensure that our systems are really effective. It's a good way uh, just to uh, try to be sure that we are doing our best for achieving the goals. We are thinking that also having researchers with us is always an opportunity to challenge our uh, previous knowledge about things. And uh, sometimes um, we all have the experience that when we are researchers to ask uh, questions, after hearing them, you have more questions than answers than when you started or uh, you thought. But we think that is really, really not only challenging, but it's very useful because we think that the matter is not only to have answers, but also to have very, very good questions. So uh, in the session today, um, I'm sure that Peter and Jon will illustrate us with some very valuable information, but also they uh, put on the table some interesting matters because they look into what we may say it should be the classical agenda for this matter in Europe during many, many years, uh, trying to answer questions about what works, what is effective, which evidence we have for ensuring that something is effective and for whom this is effective and in uh, which way this is. But I'm sure that they are going to introduce us to maybe what we may call a new agenda uh, consisting in new questions. Some of them should be, for instance, the who works agenda, what it means that uh, maybe uh, part of the answer is not what we do, maybe part of the answer seems to be or should be who do things and how this who has an impact in uh, the final results. Who are this who may be understood maybe as practitioners, but also who are the actors involved and uh, which is the role of these actors. And I think that maybe they bring us also an overarching question. is about which is the role of research in all of this process and how this uh, role may be developed in a way that at the end of the day we have a big impact, a clear influence on policymakers in the way that policies are designed, are defined. This is the frame. And now I'm going to introduce the two speakers. First of all, we are delighted to have with, with us Peter van der Laan, who is a senior researcher at the Netherlands Institute for the Study of Crime and Law Enforcement in Amsterdam, and also professor of probation and parole also at the University of Amsterdam. He has an incredible background in the criminal justice field, and for instance, yet its PhD was about alternative sanctions for juveniles. He had a lot of experience in this field. And he's, for instance, member of the Dutch Council for Criminal Administration and Child Protection and of the Chamber of Crime and Justice Group. He has also uh, been involved as an expert in, some, uh, in the production of some of the recommendations of the Council of, Jews, uh, of Europe, especially the community sanctions and measures and the new ways of dealing with juvenile delinquency. And he also participated in numerous justice, juvenile justice missions uh, to member states in the Central and Eastern Europe. 
Then we are delighted also to have with us Ioan Durnescu, who is professor at the University of Bucharest at the Faculty of Sociology and Social Work. He teaches and conducts research in the area of probation and prisons fields, and his special interest is comparative probation. He's one of the editors of the Probation in Europe and the Understanding Penal Practices. He's co-editor of the European Journal of Probation, a journal published by the University of Bucharest. And he is also a member in a number of prestigious organizations. He's a board member of the Confederation of European Probation and also the chair of the Community Sanctions and Measures Working Group within the European Society of Criminology. I think we are very happy today to have these two high experts and I just invite Peter uh, to start your speech. The floor is yours, Peter. So I'll, uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, repeat this, but uh, let's move on uh, to what I'm going to talk about. We changed the format, as you could have seen, because uh, uh, Johan and I are uh, academics, we are lecturers, and we would like to talk and to uh, present to our students. So consider yourself our students. And when I start my courses, and there will be one started starting in a couple of weeks from now, I usually start asking students what they do, where they come from. I won't ask that uh, from you, but I also will ask, uh, ask them about uh, what do you know about the subject that is to be presented in this uh, course. And, uh, and I would like to do the same for the topic that I'm uh, talking uh, about this morning. And that is, uh, suppose you are my students. What would you say if I ask you, what do you know about detention? You don't have to answer it now. But uh, be sure that uh, many of my students will say, well, we know about detention. We have seen the prisons. We know about offenders being uh, locked up. But if I ask them, what do you know about the purposes of detention? Or perhaps I should say the purposes of uh, criminal justice interventions, penal sanctions. What do you know about that? They would probably uh, answer... Uh, let me see, yes. Uh, well, this is something about protecting the public, you know, from those uh, uh, offenders by incapac incapacitating them. I don't think that they will use the word retribution, you know, that people who have done something wrong, that they deserve some sort of a punishment. But that's certainly what they would think and perhaps mention. They won't talk about general prevention simply because they do not know what exactly general prevention means. But if I tell them that there is also this purpose of sort of scaring off the general public of committing offenses, and that's why we have the system, and that's why we have a, a criminal sanction system, and that's why we have prisons, then they will understand. They won't say, oh, this is about special prevention, because they do not know what special prevention is. But if I tell them that sometimes our aim is to keep them from reoffending, to desist from crime, they will understand. And then they say, oh, yeah, that is certainly a purpose of that kind of uh, 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 intervention, including detention. 
they will certainly say something about rehabilitation, because uh, especially uh, in my country, because they believe, certainly the students that take courses in probation or take courses in criminology or uh, criminal law, they believe that there is a possibility to sort of rehabilitate people, to re-socialize them, to reintegrate them back into society. So they will be able to talk about purposes. But if asked them the other question, what do you know about the outcomes of uh, detention, if you like, often it remains very silent. And perhaps I should ask you, what do you know about the outcomes of uh, detention? Does it work? Does it scare people off, the, the general uh, uh, population, from committing crimes? We do not really know. We believe it works like that. But I suppose that most people that are never in the, uh, in the likelihood of committing crimes and that it is not the idea of perhaps I will be incarcerated that keeps them from offending. So for the large majority in the population, it does not work uh, like that. So uh, many students do not know about uh, outcomes. They would uh, uh, perhaps think of, uh, well, it does not work. Uh, that is sort of the, the popular feeling uh, about uh, criminal justice interventions and in, in particular detention. Perhaps Dutch students would be able to say, well, we know that over 70% of the ex-prisoners come into contact with the police and the judiciary again within a relatively short period. Over 70%. So isn't that the best proof that detention, that incarceration does not work? They seem to forget about the other 30% who did not reoffend, and they also seem to forget that this over 70 percentage is a sort of an average uh, outcome. But the, the understanding is that it does not work and that prisons are, what do you call them, the schools or the universities of crime. That's where you learn to sort of uh, 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 get a better grasp on how to commit uh, offenses. So in general, people on the one hand, and students on the one hand, are a bit positive and optimistic, but on the other hand, they say, well, it does not work. And that is also a sort of a general feeling among the public. And that also explains why, if you do those, those surveys among general population about support for specific criminal interventions, you will always find, especially if you come up with all kinds of additional information about offenders, about their life, about the circumstances under which crimes were committed, about victims, victimship, you will find out that the general public believes that there should be some form of retribution, there should be some form of punishment, but it better be a constructive type of punishment and that the ultimate goal for most people is not so much to punish them, but to reintegrate them back into society, to have it as uh, individually preventive as possible and really contributing to, uh, uh, well, less reoffending and desisting uh, uh, from crime. So that's kind of uh, uh, ideas, that kind of attitudes are pretty general. So if you hear about politicians in parliaments, perhaps even in European Parliament, talking about, you know, we also need to deal with these offenders in terms of mere repression because that's what the people want, don't believe them because in general most people believe that there needs to be done something, but in the end it better be constructive, it better be uh, positive in order to have better results for society as a whole but also for specific uh, vit victims and uh, uh, victim uh, groups. So uh, they do not know much about outcomes yet. They are not always that optimistic, but if we uh, uh, then talk about it a little uh, longer, then uh, they come up with all kinds of interesting ideas. And then they also understand the idea, the concept of intended and unintended uh, outcomes. An intended outcome is, of course, does it contribute to less reoffending? But what about unintended outcomes? Do we ever consider or do we ever think about what it means for, for instance, a father or a mother 
uh, being detained, what does it mean for the children, for the upbringing of the children? What kind of arrangements do we make? Does, how do they develop uh, and do they develop in a positive uh, and uh, constructive way? An unintended outcome, of course, is that of the impact that it has on the children and relatives of uh, offenders. What does it mean for chances into uh, uh, coming back into the labor market? What does it mean for romantic relationships? What does it mean for income? What does it mean for accommodation? All kinds of outcomes of something like detention that we are not always thinking about, but they're uh, certainly uh, there. And we need to know uh, more about that. And that's where uh, research uh, come in. So uh, I will talk a little bit about outcomes, intended and unintended. I will talk a little bit uh, that about the need of research. We have to find out, and that's why we need to do uh, research. And then I will uh, sort of illustrate that by using examples from concrete research projects that are currently uh, uh, conducted. I should s say, however, that believe it or not, uh, now that detention is you know, so at the forefront of the criminal justice uh, policies, that there is very little research being done on detention. Students do not know much about outcomes, but actually we as researchers, we as policymakers, do not know that much uh, either, simply because there's not that much research uh, being done. Um, however, things are improving, so there is a little bit uh, uh, more today. The first project I would like to talk uh, about is the uh, so-called prison project in the Netherlands. The prison project in the Netherlands is, as far as I know, and I'm pretty sure that I'm uh, right about that, the first and only large-scale research project in the world that for a very long time follows up ex-prisoners, prisoners and ex-prisoners, uh, and uh, aiming at finding out what it means being detained for a relatively short time or a longer uh, time. So the prison project is a longitudinal, large-scale uh, project. I won't go, go into all these uh, details. You can read them uh, yourself, but it's really big. And uh, we started some six years ago uh, designing uh, uh, the project, and we are still following some 1,900 uh, people that were uh, incarcerated uh, in, uh, uh, from autumn uh, 20. 10 to, here it says, uh, spring 2010, but it's spring 2011. And we are still following those people. We interviewed them shortly after they have uh, entered uh, the remand center, and we keep on interviewing them. But we also interview prison staff. We, pr we interview uh, probation uh, uh, workers. We interview and we assess files, criminal justice files. We talk to uh, judges, to prosecutors, in order to know and to learn as much about uh, these uh, uh, prisoners as possible. We also interview the relatives, the partners of these uh, uh, prisoners, and we do, not by interviewing, but in a s slightly other way, we also do surveys among the children of those uh, prisoners. So a huge data collection that is still going on. And what are we interested in? We are interested in their lives before they were detained, how it was going on during detention, and of course, what uh, happened after they were released uh, from uh, prison. And we try to have a very wide focus in our research. So we look at employment issues. We uh, look at very important physical and uh, mental health uh, issues. Uh, we look at what's going on in prison. How is life in prison? How is prison climate? What do prison staff do? How are prison staff trained and how can they add or perhaps not add to the well-being of prisoners but also prison staff themselves during uh, detention. So a wide array of uh, uh, very important uh, uh, topics. And we also try to include uh, issues and perhaps also contributions that also add to the experience and the outcomes of detention. Because detention, of course, does not come alone. Y you're detention experience is also uh, affected, for instance, by the way you were treated in court, the way you were 
uh, treated by the police when arrested. And whether you find yourself being taken seriously or perhaps treated as a child. And whether or not you found the final verdict, the decision by the court, whether you find it uh, a right verdict or that you thought uh, but this is completely untrue and therefore not justified, that has an impact on how you experience and how you undergo uh, detention. So therefore, we also look at what happened exactly. Why were they arrested and how was the criminal procedure and did they uh, uh, experience that one as a well, justified one, a right one uh, or not. And uh, we also look at other agencies involved. Many of our cohort of prisoners were already in contact with the probation service before they were arrested for this perhaps new crime. And sometimes the probation supervision was suspended until the end of their uh, detention uh, period. So probation service, probation workers in particular, also have a sort of an impact, almost like a say in how things are going on. And by the time they are released, early release, conditional release, then again probation workers come in and that means that the outcomes of detention are not the outcomes of detention alone, but outcomes of a whole range of activities and people and staff and officials uh, being involved. And you have to look at that. You have to find out what exactly uh, does uh, probation add to the outcome of detention. Does it perhaps strengthen positive outcomes? Or does it perhaps compensate for the negative outcomes of uh, detention? What exactly is that contribution? Very difficult to find out. And I'm lucky that this, uh, this project is still going on because I'm pretty sure that uh, in the long run, I won't be able to tell. It is exactly you know, that percentage of the effect of the outcome of the result that was uh, uh, caused by the probation service or by the prison service or whatsoever. Very difficult indeed but not a reason to leave that uh, out. Um, so um, we have to take into account a whole range of uh, topics and issues. And I'm, of course, I cannot uh, discuss them all. So uh, just uh, shortly, something about the, the organization of the uh, uh, project. You can forget this. I mean, it's a, co uh, it's a collaboration with uh, uh, two universities and my research institute. Uh, it's also perhaps interesting to know that so many researchers are involved, 15 researchers, over 100 interviewers we had, mostly uh, students. Um, perhaps uh, impressive, perhaps not. What is very good to know uh, is that until now, this project cost over 2 million euros, a lot of money. And you know, research does not come cheap. And I'm not asking for more money, but it's good to know that in the Netherlands, at least, that so many organizations, the Dutch Science Foundation, but also the Ministry of Security and Justice, the Prison Service, the Probation Service, that they all contributed to uh, this project, apparently uh, understanding that it is a, an important and worthwhile uh, uh, enterprise. Also interesting is that we also have a collaboration with the Dutch Prison Museum, because we believe we are academics, we do academic research, but the outcomes should be made available not only to practitioners and policymakers and politicians, but also to the general public. So we also set up a project together with the Dutch Prison Museum in order to sort of what we now in our jar jargon call valorization to present outcomes of uh, uh, that uh, kind of uh, 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 research. Here is one of the... Uh, uh, projects that we are uh, involved in, and it has to do with health, prisoners' uh, health. And why? We do know that there is a high prevalence of uh, health problems uh, uh, for prisoners. And um, we know that uh, 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 the correctional institutions are often seen as a sort of a reservoir of uh, physical and mental health uh, problems. It is indeed a very important uh, issue. Uh, what do we know about physical health and mental health when they enter prison? What do we know uh, about their health when they uh, 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 are released and we get back into uh, society? What do we know about the impact of detention as such on mental health and physical health? 
in general, we know that the, uh, the physical and mental health situation of prisoners is not very good. This uh, 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 graph shows you or does, uh, shows a comparison uh, between the prison population and the general population with regard to health status. This is self-report. This is what they, self, they themselves say about whether in general they feel uh, healthy or not that healthy. And you can see in all age categories that prisoners uh, feel less healthy than uh, what you would find in the general population. For us, perhaps not a surprise, but it's good to know uh, that it is. And then for, uh, further on, we have to check and to find out what happens to them, whether it changes, and how we can explain perhaps these uh, health uh, problems. Here, this is again this is a little bit uh, comparable, uh, showing uh, mental health situation, again, by means of uh, self-report, where we compared prisoners with the uh, general uh, population. And you would see that uh, in all kinds uh, of uh, areas, domains, uh, uh, the problems are much higher among uh, prisoners. For instance, depressive problems, if I can read it properly, uh, it is, uh, 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 the, the prevalence is twice as high as in the uh, general population. So it is not a, a very healthy uh, population in society. Uh, this one is about feelings of uh, hostility, uh, depression, paranoid thoughts, and again, you will see that the prison population uh, is much more problematic in that respect than the general uh, population. And then uh, this one with regard to uh, physical health, uh, you see again fatigue, migraine. Well, migraine is uh, uh, yeah, well, twice uh, as much again. Back problems, hernias. You will see that all kinds of physical problems are also more prevalent among uh, prisoners than among the general uh, population. And uh, what would you think about drug use and alcohol use? Well, you won't be disappointed. It is that far more uh, problematic among prisoners, of course, than the general population, showing that the prison service, and the, the same goes through for the probation service, is dealing with a very problematic uh, population. And uh, drug problems are indeed serious. And they are serious at the time, but they are, of course, also very serious when it comes to the perspective, the future aspect, perspective of people and the chances, for instance, of desisting uh, from crime. Drugs, alcohol, well, serious drinkers uh, in prison, uh, perhaps not during prison uh, time, but uh, certainly before and probably also uh, after. So uh, serious uh, problems. So what do we know? They have diverse pre-existing health problems. They come in with problems. So they are already there. And the question, which is very often uh, mentioned, is whether the experience of being incarcerated, the almost traumatic experience, does that add to these health uh, problems? It does, but not for a, uh, a very long time. So in general, they are, their health is more problematic. It increases, especially during the first month, two months of incarceration, but then it goes down. And we have now also seen for those prisoners who have uh, left prison in our research that when it comes uh, to health they have very much improved. They do much better physically but also mentally even without being specifically treated. I mean they get their medicines, some uh, get also some kind of uh, mental uh, health uh, treatment but many do not but nevertheless they do much better and in that kind uh, respect, you could see detention as a sort of respite care. You know, especially for those, you know, the, the seriously addicted uh, people, uh, it is, it's a period of rest. And they are well kept, they are well fed, they get their medicine. So in that case, detention helps improving their health. The question, of course, is for how long does that stay? And I'm afraid to say that for many, not that long. So detention is a very healthy kind of circumstances but afterwards if there is no additional care 
no aftercare whatsoever, it becomes much more difficult. So what's the outcome of detention in this regard? It's a positive one, but unfortunately not always a very long-lasting one. Um, I'll skip this. Then another project. Uh, I, you have to warn me if I'm running out of time, but um, something completely uh, different. Architecture and prison, prison life. Um, you probably, I don't know whether you have been to uh, prisons, but I'm pretty sure that you know about prisons and that you have a sort of, uh, can draw yourself a picture of a, a prison. There are many prisons in Europe. We saw the figures. Uh, Kirsten uh, talked about that. And there are many uh, facilities in uh, my country as well. And I don't know whether you can see it, but this is roughly five types of prison design. These are uh, the more, the older ones, uh, uh, what we call the Panopticon uh, design, and this is uh, certainly uh, more newer ones. Uh, I don't know whether you have been to Amsterdam, but if you come by train from Utrecht to Amsterdam or take a metro uh, from uh, 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 Amsterdam southeast, you pass by this six blocks uh, of the, the prison over Amstel in Amsterdam. Uh, if you look careful, you will notice it's a prison. From way further, perhaps not. But these are roughly five prison uh, designs. Does it have an impact on prison climate? What does it mean for the feeling of safety, security inside a prison, for both prisoners and prison staff? Does prison architecture affect uh, relationships between prisoners and prison staff? Interesting questions, not that often uh, uh, researched, but we believe that it was indeed important to uh, uh, find out uh, whether we could uh, s think something. And here are uh, some uh, of the uh, outcomes. Uh, and again, these are surveys, these are questionnaires filled in uh, by prisoners, interviews, uh, and uh, talking, uh, and then later on, of course, we divided them uh, according to what type of uh, prison they were staying in. This is about, you know, the feeling of autonomy. That is a tricky concept, by the way, because there is not, uh, not much autonomy when you are uh, detained. But nevertheless, what you could see is that um, those people staying in a, uh, in a sorry, did I went a little bit too, early, too fast, um, who are staying in a high rise, relatively modern uh, uh, prison, the ones near Amsterdam, they have a slightly higher idea of keeping themselves, being able to express their autonomy. And those staying in the panopticon, the older uh, buildings, their, the score is lower. And if we do this uh, for the feeling of safety, <coughs> we see more or less the same uh, outcome. And if we look at relationships with staff, then again, the, uh, can I say, the traditional, old-fashioned, huge panopticon uh, buildings, prisoners staying there are less positive about relationships with uh, prison uh, staff. Uh, is this a matter of architecture? Of course, not completely. Prison staff is also uh, important. But you can understand that when you are staying in a facility, which is very noisy, with uh, provisions that are not as modern and adequate as they are in some of the more modern uh, prisons. If you're staying in relatively small units, and some facilities provide smaller units than others, then uh, prison staff relationships are much better than in these huge uh, facilities. And that explains why perhaps, uh, well, I should say, I should speak for myself, why I found it pretty positive uh, or uh, pretty surprising that this high-rise prison was doing so well. But the main explanation for that is that prisoners in these high-rise prisons stay in relatively small facilities. And therefore, and I think it's, uh, I look at uh, Peter van der Zanden, I think it's a, a sort of uh, uh, really uh, very, very problematic to run such prisons because they are very, very expensive because of the infrastructure. But in terms of prison climate, 
prison staff and prisoner relationships, that is something to be preferred. And it also shows that it's perhaps sometimes we thought that the size of a prison uh, should be taken into account, which is in a way uh, true, and that we should be uh, uh, concerned about too big prisons. But even if you are able to set up to build a huge prison, but you are able to, u to work with very small units, then the possible downside of this huge uh, facility can be uh, overcome. What do we have more? Well, this is uh, sort of summing up the outcomes of the, uh, uh, the project on uh, architecture. Can you use that when you have to uh, build new prisons? I hope uh, one does. And I know of a project here in Belgium where also academics were involved in thinking about uh, uh, and developing uh, new uh, prisons. And as a matter of fact, in the Netherlands too, even though many of the prisons are now being closed, there will be a few uh, uh, new ones uh, built. And there are also working groups, including uh, researchers, uh, are thinking about, uh, I don't know whether it's a proper word, but the ideal or the future uh, prison. Employment, very important. Uh, if only because we uh, all believe that uh, uh, while in prison they have to do something, they have to work, etc. But it's of course also imp important to know, is it true that what we often think, that periods of detention immediately interrupt uh, uh, being employed, careers in uh, uh, em employment? So uh, we also uh, had a look at that. And then again, you, you could see that uh, we are talking about a problematic population. Uh, unhealthy, but also many unemployed way before they were uh, incarcerated. So we had a look at uh, uh, various aspects of uh, employment before, during, uh, uh, meaning uh, taking courses and uh, doing work, and after, and uh, uh, in some very simple, um, over uh, uh, almost two thirds did not work before they were incarcerated. Within six months after release, 50% of those prisoners released found a job, which was much higher than we expected. And we were of course also interested to know and to learn to what extent detention had an impact on that because they took courses or perhaps they did some sort of a labor uh, training, whether they were supported uh, uh, in uh, thinking about getting a job afterwards, and also whether or not the kind of organizations were involved in finding them a job. And to, uh, to start with uh, uh, the latter, most of those people who were able to find a job after detention did so on their own. And they found it in their own uh, social formal, mostly informal network. So the agencies that are uh, active, you know, in all uh, cities and towns, finding people uh, who are difficult to employ, finding them jobs, did not add that much. They did it themselves. That was that is a very, an interesting and perhaps also a little bit reassuring uh, outcome. Um, we asked them, what did you think about the way when you were in prison, how you were uh, prepared for getting a job. And uh, I don't know uh, what kind of color this is, but this shows that uh, people were, a, a large majority did not agree to this statement that they were rare prepared during detention for employment later on. And again, a majority uh, was not agreeing to the statement that the prison did a lot for me with regard to employment. And again, uh, a special program that takes into account all kinds of uh, important things that are needed for employment. Again, a large majority of the prisoners were not very positive. In general, and that's the, the main message, uh, prisoners, released prisoners, are far from positive about the contribution uh, uh, of uh, prisons to their chances to get uh, work later on. This is uh, uh, a very simple simple slide, and uh, unfortunately in Dutch, but uh, it shows that uh, three quarters of the people that we are following did some work during detention, and about 25% did not. 
and especially these 25% were the ones who were on remand and who were relatively short uh, on remand. So three quarters indeed worked. This shows to what extent prisoners uh, took part in courses related to reintegration into the labor market. Three quarters of them did not take part in that. Only a quarter did. I should add, of course, that uh, you cannot, when you enter prison, immediately ask for, can I uh, participate in this course on uh, uh, employment and getting employment? That takes time, and you have to uh, uh, meet certain uh, conditions. So uh, it is, this is a slightly uh, uh, tricky uh, kind of uh, graph. But um, we found that the likelihood of being employed after imprisonment increased by being employed before imprisonment. If the period of detention was short, and by the way, in the Netherlands, on average, it is indeed short. I think, uh, I don't know, 80% less than three months. So uh, that is uh, indeed very short. And uh, the likelihood is also increased if they are positive about the support provided uh, by the prisons. There was no impact whatsoever of having uh, uh, worked while in prison on future employment chances. And that is perhaps disappointing. On the other hand, very often the kind of work that is being done in prison is not the most exciting work. It is not the kind of work where you can uh, make a lot of money uh, of. So we should not be surprised to that. And then finally, those who did some sort of vocational training in prison did not experience bigger chances of getting work. And that is also a worrying one, because you would argue that if we are able to train people and to make them uh, in that way more adequate, more matching uh, needs of the employment market, that should work, but it does not. And I remember, and we, it, this is difficult to explain, and perhaps you have ideas about that, but uh, a long time ago, I came across a project, I think it was in North Rhineland, Westfalen, where it said that vocational training can be very effective in getting prisoners a job, but only if there is some sort of job guarantee attached to it. And if, if there's no job guarantee, then perhaps uh, people get easily frustrated because now I'm finally uh, properly trained and I do not get a job. And I remember a very interesting project, uh, and I was telling about it uh, yesterday night, and uh, Peter van der Zande sur surely uh, can uh, remember that one, which was in uh, one of the remand centers in Amsterdam, where uh, prisoners were trained as a junior roustabout for the oil industry. And the, uh, what was good about it, it was exciting work, it was well-paid work, and, um, but more importantly, it, this training was set up in uh, collaboration with the, uh, the industry, and they provided job guarantees. But as, and then, you know, after a couple of years, there was this another economic crisis, and the job guarantee could not uh, uh, provide it anymore and that was, I think, more or less the end of that project. So vocational training is important, but there should be more added to that. Yeah, 10 minutes, no, that's not too bad. Um, let me see, yeah, this, this is simply, uh, something different. Perhaps I should also say a little bit, because you know, we have been talking to these uh, uh, prisoners and their relatives, etc., uh, many, many times. And, um, uh, and as a matter of fact, we were quite lucky that the attrition from this research cohort was relatively limited. We believe it has to do with the fact that we were uh, generally interested in them and also that we provided some money uh, to them uh, for the interviews, especially after uh, uh, release. We figured out um, to what extent uh, they were coming from firm social networks, and they indeed have a firm social network. Do we, uh, we had the expectation that perhaps the social network of prisoners is smaller 
than that if of people of the general population, but that is not the case. They have strong social networks. How do these social networks uh, continue while in prison? And of course, they become weaker, simply because they have uh, fewer uh, uh, contacts with these uh, social uh, networks. But what is interesting to see, and that is of what I would say also a positive outcome, is that the social networks, the old social networks, are able to be picked up after release. And that the same people that were important to them before uh, prison are also important afterwards. And if you relate that to this outcome that many of the prisoners find a job in their own informal network, then you will uh, understand the importance of these social networks. And in terms of policy and practice, it should uh, remind us of how are, can we, in one way or another, try to maintain the strength of social networks, even though they are being detained. And then what is then important, of course, visits, contacts, uh, uh, whatsoever. And uh, in the Netherlands, it's a small country, but even there, distances for relatives to visit are sometimes too big or uh, too uh, expensive. And uh, it reminds me of a completely uh, different kind of uh, uh, research project, but also very interesting. You know, uh, perhaps about uh, uh, Belgium um, leasing uh, prison cells in the Netherlands. I think there's some uh, around 400 Belgian prisoners staying in a Dutch prison with Dutch prison staff run, though, by a Belgium uh, prison uh, governor. Uh, there has been uh, research, not, uh, not by me or my colleagues, but by other uh, colleagues, research on that specific program, because that is also intriguing. Uh, at least I find it intriguing to find out how would Belgian prisoners, who very often come from very overcrowded prisons, how would they experience a Dutch uh, prison, which is run by Dutch staff with uh, uh, the Dutch, uh, how should I say, rules and the way of approach and attitudes of uh, uh, prison staff. The outcome of that research was uh, very surprising, or well, was not so surprising, I should say. Um, Belgian prisoners were, in general, relatively positive. Not about the distance from home. Not about the distance that uh, relatives had to uh, travel in order to visit them. They were also not that positive about Dutch food. And uh, after having dinner uh, last night in Brussels, I understand. I mean, that is uh, very simple uh, indeed. Um, where they were very, very positive about, that was the way they were treated by Dutch prison staff. The title of this uh, report in Dutch, uh, and I'll try to translate it, is uh, say, uh, say um, uh, John to our uh, governor, meaning that it was almost a sort of informal kind of relationship between prisoners and uh, staff. And they had the idea, we are f really feeling being understood uh, by uh, the staff. And they uh, have a serious, genuine interest in our well-being, etc. So that's a very interesting uh, outcome. And I think that uh, the Dutch uh, State Secretary uh, of uh, Justice also appreciated that very much. And I think that is absolutely true, if, uh, it because it showed that uh, the way uh, prison staff in the Netherlands is being trained may help, or certainly will help, to sort of improve uh, uh, climate uh, in prison. Though the worrying aspect, of course, is, uh, because that's why I mentioned uh, this example, is uh, uh, how are you able to keep up your relationship with your social network? And that is, that is difficult. And it makes me also wonder, because the latest in this is that uh, Norway is now going to lease prison cells in the Netherlands. How will they arrange for visits by relatives if Norwegian prisoners are staying in Dutch uh, cells? So, but I mean, I know too little about that. But on the other hand, it is uh, something interesting to think about. Finally, two minutes. Let me just say uh, something about aftercare. We very often say uh, detention is one thing. Aftercare, if there's no aftercare, then we perhaps will sort of uh, uh, leave 
uh, back, leave alone what we accomplished during uh, detention. Aftercare by the probation service or perhaps other agencies is very important uh, indeed. And we have also done uh, and still doing research on outcomes and effectiveness of aftercare uh, programs. And what I would like to sh show you is a series of outcomes that are indeed very important and to take into account when we are talking about aftercare and when we are designing aftercare programs because they are indeed uh, very uh, important but in a slightly different way than we expected beforehand. We found from a whole range of studies all over the world that aftercare can have a positive though small effect of re on reoffending. So that alone is reason enough to think about how to provide uh, aftercare. We also know that if a program, and that is sort of a gen more general outcome, if it's well implemented, such a program, the results are much, much better. Intensity of a program, of an intervention, if you wish, is also very important. If we keep on doing not that intensive kind of interventions, don't, uh, won't be, you should not be uh, uh, surprised that the outcomes are not that promising. However, if we act more intensively, meaning weekly contacts, all kinds of activities, then uh, the impact on reoffending, on resistance, can be quite big. Also interesting to find out the duration of aftercare. We also always believe, well, it should be at least six months or nine months. It's not that important. Intensity, even if it's only for two months, is much more important. Aftercare programs are uh, more effective for uh, older people, older youth, than for the youngest ones. It's, they are certainly more effective for the higher risk people, the more serious offenders with the more serious uh, problems and all kinds of other things that we as academics often find interesting and important to find out did not uh, make uh, that difference. The final one I would like to uh, mention is this one. Starting aftercare before release from prison does not increase effectiveness. And that's an interesting one because we always believed that if you start an aftercare program, aftercare program if you start supervision, your probation officer should come to prison early, a couple of months before release. And that was the best way to sort of smoothly guide the transition from prison to society. But it does not seem to be the case. If it's only the day uh, of release or the day before release, that's okay. And it's far more important what exactly is being done afterwards. Well, much more to say and to tell about outcomes of, uh, of prison uh, research, but uh, I'm sure that uh, Johan uh, will take us to uh, many more of these, well, interesting outcomes and often also positive uh, outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for your very, very interesting speech. I invite you on to take the floor. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm also very honored to be here and to speak in front of such a qualified audience. It's almost intimidating. I can see representatives of uh, Romania here. Uh, it's very interesting for me from University of Bucharest to speak in front of our colleagues. Um, how are you, first of all? Are you okay? Are you, can you take more? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I noticed that when you came, you were all very enthusiastic and very curious, and, uh, and now I don't see you smiling anymore. <laughs> That's a little bit worrying. <laughs> Um, all I can promise is that I can go fast uh, and we can, uh, we can finish in half an hour and then allow a little bit um, uh, of time for discussions. Uh, actually, my intention is to challenge you with another perspective. If Peter wanted you to be students, I want you to be our partners. Uh, you all come uh, and represent different countries, different authorities, different, you know, you come from the delegation or from the commission. 
Um, and uh, it would be very interesting for us, I think, if uh, you would uh, look at us as your partners, your critical friends, so we can uh, together think of something that uh, it can change the criminal justice landscape in Europe. So be our partners and come up with uh, ideas, uh, questions, uh, and why not policy initiatives and so on. Uh, I will try to be, uh, as I said, very uh, brief, very fast. Uh, but in the same time, trying to cover uh, what I wanted to cover. First of all, my, the, the aim of this presentation is to critically present the state of art in terms of what we know about why offenders stop offending and um, desist. And also try to put forward some ideas for the, for the future. But of course, these ideas would need to be blended with your ideas and uh, your thinking. The question of why offenders stop offending is, is a very old one, as you, as you know. It's, it's from ages, from the 17th century, 18th century, and so on. We had many, many ideas about how we can help people stop offending. We had ideas about uh, helping offenders to go back to God and to pray more, and they will become uh, better people, and uh, hopefully they will stop offending, uh, giving up alcohol, we also provided a lot of moral education, uh, especially in, in, inside the prisons, inside the institutions. Um, after the Second World War, we started to provide the so-called social case work, you know, the, the medical model. We started to talk about uh, diagnosis, about uh, assessments, and uh, we wanted to help offenders stop offending by providing them with, with advice, with role models, with housing and money and so on. Uh, we also had some very interesting and strange ideas uh, about how we can help offenders uh, stop offending, like uh, the breathing therapy. Do you know this, breathing therapy? It was a, a general uh, idea that uh, um, the, the cells of the, the offender's brain are not very well, uh, um, uh, they don't receive enough oxygen, so we helped offenders to breathe properly so they can have enough oxygen in their brain and then therefore become better people, obviously. We also had dressing therapy. We, all, we noticed that uh, they, um, uh, most of the offenders are quite um, uh, men-like, uh, very macho culture, uh, and therefore we encourage them to, to wear you know, uh, women dresses, and, uh, and then obviously they would become better and uh, become less macho and you got, you, you got it, they desisted, they, they stopped offending. Uh, we also ha uh, had uh, the uh, attention therapy. You know this one? No? A attention therapy is also very interesting and it comes from uh, yoga practice. Uh, they were helped to concentrate o on a, a, a certain point on the wall, uh, and hopefully this will encourage them to uh, concentrate better, to focus better, and therefore to be more able to anticipate the consequences of their facts, and therefore, yes, stop offending, obviously. Uh, well, that was not the case, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, in the 17s, uh, in, uh, 1974, the United States government ordered a, a general inquiry, a general evaluation, um, uh, especially Professor Martinson was uh, in charge with that. and. Um, he discovered actually that none of these uh, uh, ideas actually made a greater impact on reoffending than others. And therefore, the, the, the whole criminology world started to, uh, to become quite depressive, quite uh, pessimistic about what can be done to help offenders stop offending. So we, we entered this, uh, this uh, nothing works um, uh, philosophy, which um, hopefully ended in the 90s when a lot of uh, the research done by Martinson was re-evaluated by uh, uh, some uh, Canadians, uh, Canadian researchers. Some more research was done and therefore uh, some ideas were find, found to be uh, more effective than others in terms of reducing reoffending. And the first one, uh, and this is now the mainstream um, uh, paradigm for working with offenders is so-called R&R model, uh, which is a, uh, is a risk needs responsivity model developed by the Canadians 
which says that the, uh, the, the programs, the interventions uh, on offenders, either inside or outside prison, should match the level of risk. Therefore, if the offender is high-risk offender, then the intervention should be very intensive. The, the, the frequency of the meetings should be quite high and so on. Uh, the second principle is the need principle, which speaks about the intervention should target the criminogenic needs, not er any kind of need, but the, the so-called criminogen criminogenic needs. Uh, and the third principle is um, the intervention should uh, match the learning style of the offenders, the responsivity principle. Um, and uh, in, under this, uh, this heading, the cognitive behavioral interventions were found to be very, very effective. And uh, we have quite a lot of research demonstrating that if you apply these principles in a consistent way, you can uh, reduce your offending recidivism between 26 to 30 percent. Uh, and we have a lot of projects, uh, a lot of programs that were evaluated, that, that were based on these principles and were later on evaluated. And um, as you can see on the slide, uh, you can find quite a big uh, difference in reconviction rates up to 13, 14 percent. Nowadays, in the last, let's say, five to ten years, a new paradigm is, uh, is uh, growing. It's called the desistance paradigm, which uh, starts from a different angle, from a different perspective. It doesn't ask the question why some people reoffend, but ask the question why some people stop offending. How come some of them desist from crime? And we have a few interesting theories that uh, prove to be quite, uh, quite effective in uh, helping people desist from crime and stay desisted, like the maturation reform. We all know that uh, once we go older, we tend to become more well-behaved. We have more to lose, and we tend to, to stop offending. Um, desistance as a decision. So we have a lot of research demonstrating that desistance is a subjective process. And it's very important to, to be careful with this process. The bond theory showing that uh, people getting married, um, uh, having a child, uh, getting into employment, or going to army, all these factors can uh, help offenders stop offending at a certain point. We also learned about the pro-social identity. We learned that it's important for people to develop a new identity, a non-criminal identity, in order to uh, be encouraged to stop offending. So we are very careful um, to this kind of cognitive transformation. Um, we also became aware of the individual agency and social structure. We became um, uh, aware of uh, how institutions can help or, uh, on the contrary, um, stop or prevent desistance. There are some implications for these uh, uh, findings, uh, the criminal justice implications, and I think it's, very, uh, it's a very good place here to discuss about these implications. For example, the assistance is a long and complex process. It's not as we, we tend to believe that stop, stopping offending is like a decision, okay, from tomorrow I will stop offending. It's not like that. It's a very complex and difficult process. There are researchers speaking about a zigzag process. Sometimes offenders uh, start to decelerate, start to commit less serious crimes or less often crimes, less fragrant crimes. Uh, but unfortunately, our criminal justice uh, systems are, uh, is not ready, are not ready to deal with this kind of deceleration. We treat them as reoffenders or, or recidivists, and we send them back to prison. And this is not helping the process of desistance. Desistance is an individual and subjective process. Uh, we discussed about the pro-social identity, about, uh, uh, about cognitive transformation, and so on. Uh, and again, our criminal justice uh, system is not ready to deal with this. We tend to, to look at the, the processes in a more industrial fashion. We tend to believe that one size fits all. We have programs, and we try to fit offenders into different programs, but this is not working. We need to look at offenders as individuals and help them through the process of transformation uh, in a, on a kind of individual uh, path 
and not as a, as a kind of a, a, a large group of people uh, which needs the same kind of treatment. Hope is very important, again. So people need to be hopeful that they will succeed and therefore uh, they have better chances to succeed. Relationship between offenders and uh, the correctional staff is very, very uh, important and we, tended, we tend to forget about that, especially uh, in the last, uh, only in the last five years we started to, to look at the relationship uh, a little bit more closer. Before then we tended to, to forget about it. Um, we also tended to look at offenders as risk carriers and not as, uh, as people. Uh, we always treated them as uh, uh, according to their kind of uh, risk factors, but we neglected the strengths and the opportunities that the assistance is talking about. Um, also very important is not only to work with offenders, not only to develop human capital, but also to develop opportunities and uh, uh, social capital where the, 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 the offenders would have the chance to exercise the new pro-social identities. Most of these offenders, as uh, Peter emphasized in his presentation, uh, had very few opportunities after release or uh, after being convicted. Uh, even more, sometimes even the state legislation, with the uh, uh, criminal record legislation especially, even place, places more obstacles in, uh, in, the, in the path of uh, uh, reintegration than uh, is helping the, 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 the process of the systems. But I will come back to this a little bit later. We have a new line of research now in the, in the, in the last 10 years. We started to, to learn that it's not enough to have good interventions or good principles when we work with offenders, but it's very important how and who and with what kind of attitude and skills the personnel, the staff, is dealing with, uh, with, uh, with the prisoners. So we have quite a handful of evidence what kind of staff, uh, what kind of staff skills we need when working with offenders. We know about pro-social modeling and reinforcement, problem solving, role clarification. We know about empathy, the importance of empathy, the importance of structuring skills. And we know about the uh, core correctional practices, so-called, again, coming from Canada, effective use of authority, anti-discrimination, anti-criminal modeling and reinforcement, problem solving, use of community resources and quality of the interpersonal relationships. All these factors are very, very important when working with offenders. So it's not only the content of the intervention, but also the way we deliver this information. Furthermore, what we know from research is that employment is really, really important, but not employment as such. Employ which we are talking here about meaningful employment. We need to help offenders to find a, a, a job that is meaningful for him or her, uh, that is, is helping him to develop. It's not just any job. It has to be a job that is important for him or her. Uh, we also know about the job stability and the importance of uh, age in this respect. We also know about the importance of family. And again, we tend to neglect the family as a natural system of reintegration when we work with offenders. But the family is very, very important. And we have research, especially coming from the United States, demonstrating that family is very important for ex-offenders uh, when it comes to finding a job, when uh, it comes to financial support, housing, and uh, when it comes to advice and moral support. There are obvious things, and we have evidence about this, but we still don't use enough the family resources when we deal with offenders inside the prison or outside the prison. Friends and peer are also very, very important. Uh, and Peter touched on this a little bit uh, when he spoke about the informal networks that are really useful when, when it comes to employment. It's true that most of the offenders find uh, employment not via uh, our uh, great institutions or agencies. They find uh, employment uh, through their family. Usually family acts as a, uh, act as a kind of resource, as an information resource or as a network resource. The family learns about new, new jobs available. They liaise with uh, the local people and they can help uh, prisoners to to, to get a new job. Friends and peers are doing the same. Of course, we need to be careful that these friends and peers need to be uh, pro-social contacts and not anti-social contacts 
we don't want that. Uh, the good communities are also very, very important, and uh, we have to be very careful how we deal with this. We have evidence that communities that have good schools, good uh, health facilities, good social services, they manage to be more inclusive and uh, help offenders desist from crime. We also have about uh, we have about we have um, evidence about um, uh, the status degradation, de uh, uh, degradation and stigma. We know that uh, a lot of ex-prisoners experience this, co this this kind of uh, obstacle when they come out of prison. The criminal record in a lot of European countries need to be reformed because it's it's too rigid and it's too stigmatizing. A lot of employers are now asking for a, uh, for a criminal record uh, uh, certificate. And when these certificates are produced, they show a conviction. And in uh, uh, most cases, employers are not willing uh, to employ uh, uh, ex-offenders, ex-prisoners. But uh, we need to find a way to balance the right to know of the employers with the right to start a new life of the offenders. So we need to be a little bit more careful how we can help the process of reintegration and not uh, restrict it in, uh, with our legislation. Restorative justice is also proved to be effective. I'm not going into very many details, but there, we have proofs that mediation decreases the frequency of the reconviction within two years. So it's, it's very encouraging. So restorative justice is a very good path to, to go, not only from the perspective of victims, but also from the perspective of offenders. What else do we know? We know that education is quite useful uh, when inside the prison. It's not only useful for when they come out, but it's useful for, for when they are inside the prison. They tend to adapt a little bit uh, better to the institutional regime. If they, uh, if they undertake education. Work and voca vocational training. We have some evidence coming from United States, from uh, Sater and Cadella. It's a meta-analysis, very influential, that shows that sometimes work and vocational training can produce positive outcomes, but only when they are connected to real job opportunities on the market. If it's organized just uh, uh, as an exercise to keep uh, offenders busy, that's not helpful. But if these uh, vocational trainings are uh, 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 accompanied with uh, placements and real available jobs after release, then yes, vocational training is quite effective in reducing reoffending. So it's not only about uh, providing this, but what kind of training? And uh, what kind of market do you have to absorb these uh, prisoners? Pre-post-test release interventions, we also have some uh, um, evidence that uh, if they start uh, inside the prison and they carry on uh, after the prison, in some circumstances, they can produce positive uh, results. Mentoring is also uh, another promising practice. But uh, again, we have to be very careful and not to take the, 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 the root of some governments hoping that uh, voluntary mentoring will replace uh, probation or uh, some other kind of interventions. Mentoring needs to be accompanied with professional help, with professional uh, intervention. Mentoring together with something else would make a difference. Mentoring alone is not effective when working with offenders. And we have quite a, a, a lot of evidence in this respect. And actually tomorrow here in Brussels, uh, the report will be um, presented uh, in this uh, uh, respect. Halfway houses are also very useful uh, it, and it helps prisoners to come back gradually into the community. And we have some um, evidence that they can really uh, make a positive impact, but not alone, but together with other sort of uh, interventions. About probation, what we know also is that if probation officers are working in large, uh, in big organizations, or they have large caseloads, they tend to uh, use punitive supervisory strategies, and they tend to be less effective than their colleagues. So again, the organizational climate, the organizational architecture is very, very important, not only for the prisoners, but also for the probationers. We have to take all these findings with some sort of caution. 
uh, most of them are uh, didn't take uh, uh, didn't have very long follow-up periods. They some of them didn't use very robust methodologies, uh, and this is a whole discussion. We don't want to go into this discussion, but sometimes in the near future we will have to think about creative methodologies on how to evaluate the impact and so on. Um, some of these findings were not replicated in uh, some countries, uh, uh, in other countries, so it's difficult to see, it's difficult to say if it's, uh, it's, it's a matter of context or not. Uh, some of them rely on official data, and we know that official data is not always reliable. And they all, uh, most of the time they look at the reconviction as the only success uh, indicator, which is not the case. Again, in some cases, we had beautiful experiments, beautiful outcomes, but when, this, uh, when that experiment became mainstream, was transferred into the, the current uh, routines, uh, the outcomes were not so successful. So we need to look more uh, at how this knowledge can be uh, transferred into the real uh, practices. A pos possible future, as I said, I think we know quite a great deal of things about what works with, uh, with offenders, what can help offenders desist from crime, but we have to start using this information, this knowledge, when we design our public policies and practices. Um, more, uh, more research is needed. We need to think about more robust and independent research. We need to, Im to involve institutes universities, research centers that would come from outside the organizations to look at the outcomes and the, the processes uh, um, f in our uh, practices. Again, what you, we can see if we look around, we can see that some of this knowledge is used in different countries, but not all of them. They are used uh, here and there, and uh, they are not used in a kind of integrated manner. We know that's, that's, that's not effective enough if we provide, let's say, health treatment for, uh, for a drug addict, if we don't provide um, housing, counseling, mentoring, if we, don't, we, if we are not careful with the criminal record policies and so on, uh, the person is quite likely to, 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 to uh, re-offend. So my point here is that we know quite a great deal of information about what works with offenders. Let's try and use this kind of information in a kind of integrated way, in a kind of integrated national or why not European public policy of offender reintegration. I think we can put all this information together and make, uh, make a, a whole system working uh, evident, uh, based on evidence and not based on God knows uh, what kind of myths or uh, um, false ideas. Again, we know, we know quite a lot about uh, the importance of working with victims, or working with families and communities. We have to be a little bit more brave and try to use this kind of information into our current routines and involve the communities, involve the victims in, when working with offenders, of course, if they wish so. Train criminal justice staff on using this or on developing this kind of skills that are proved to be effective. We need to use this information, again, in a kind of meaningful way and make the, 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 the probation or the prison organizations work better. Um, we also need to, to avoid cynicism and overcrowding. Um, we were discussing yesterday about uh, you know, the, the prisons, and it, it's quite obvious when you talk about a prison, you know that that prison has a 500 uh, beds capacity, and you cannot go over that. But when you talk about probation, we don't take this approach anymore because uh, uh, you can see probation services working with, uh, let's say, one probation officer for 40 clients, for 40 probationers, but you can also find probation officers working with 100, maybe 200 probationers. And obviously, this is not, uh, uh, this is not the way we should go. Probation services are not, uh, as uh, John called, called it uh, yesterday, an elastic resource. We have to be careful with the caseload that we allocate to probation services. 
because probation services can be also overcrowded and if they are overcrowded we cannot expect them to perform well. So we need to pay attention to this as well. Um, and we have to invest. Working with offenders, it's, uh, uh, even if it's evidence-based, it costs money. Uh, and unfortunately, even the, the most the richest countries in the world, they don't deal in a serious way with this matter. And uh, we have Luik Vacant uh, demonstrated that in the United States when they adopted the Second Chance Act in the 2008, he demonstrated that the budget allocated for the implementation of, the, of this reintegration policy in the United States was uh, the equivalent, equivalent of one sandwich per ex-prisoner per week. So you can imagine with this sort of resource what kind of impact you can have, what kind of uh, performance you can expect. So let's, build, let's use this knowledge, let's build up a, a, a national and why not a European public policy on, uh, on offender reintegration and then let's be serious about resources. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to two speakers, not only for the knowledge they asked to, uh, to us, but also for being so um, for being so disciplined with with time. We know that you are seated here for two hours, and we did not offer you a coffee, but <laughs> we asked you for uh, the last offer. I think that uh, after this such uh, so interesting speeches is the right time just for open the floor to you and um, what we are going to do is that we are approach a microphone because uh, the whole session is also registered and it should be available on, online uh, in the different sources and I will thank you very much if you can present yourself uh, ask the question and our two experts will be in conditions to comment thank you we have first question there. My name is Carmen Nicola from the Romanian uh, Perm Rep of the EU. And uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, we consider that we need this kind of initiatives in order to make uh, common uh, criminal policies to the European level. First of all, uh, I have a small remark. Uh, the Generalist Secretary, Mr. Peter, uh, Mr. Willem van der Brugge, uh, talked about the um, Probation Act in uh, Romania of uh, 2013. And uh, we have to underline that uh, it's the not the first law on the probation in Romania. It's um, a result of uh, more than 10 years of experience. So uh, we have special legislation on probation for uh, 2000. And um, the last uh, one uh, act who entered into force uh, in the last uh, year, it's um, a part of the um, most important uh, criminal justice reform in Romania which included a um, new criminal code, a new criminal procedural code, and a special law on the uh, execution of the criminal sanctions. So just to tell you that uh, we are uh, still uh, young in this field, comparative to the Netherlands, but we are ready to learn and share good practices. Okay, and um, for the um, researchers uh, that presented uh, the results uh, today, and um, we uh, really know that we need the research. It's maybe the most important aspect in, uh, in order to have um, criminal policies, uh, in order to use the results of the res these researchers. And um, it's uh, maybe a suggestion. Uh, we would like um, to, to know more about the situation of the offenders that um, are uh, parts of uh, organized crime. Maybe they have uh, special needs and uh, maybe then uh, that uh, we could use special uh, methods and uh, um, 
other uh, possibilities to, to ensure uh, the reintegration of the, and the rehabilitation of these offenders. Maybe it could be a good topic for, uh, for the future. Thank you so much. Can I react to this? I think you are p perfectly right about it. It's, um, uh, we, we presented here just a general knowledge about uh, what works with the general population of offenders, but of course research is much more structured than that, and we have information about what works with uh, minorities, what works with uh, 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 female offenders and with, uh, uh, with uh, young offenders and adult offenders and so on, and obviously we need to do more about uh, organized crime and uh, uh, sex offenders and drink driving offenders and, and so on. But um, uh, evidence is there. Uh, we just need to, to grab it and develop it and use it properly. Thanks. Hello, uh, my name is Piera D'Arrigo and I work for uh, the Juvenile Justice Center in Palermo in Sicily. Um, my question is, you were talking about parents who are uh, detained, who are in detention. And my question is, which kind of consequence does he have the detention of uh, a man or a woman or a parent to all the family? I'll give you a specific example. This case happened to me many times, which I have a young offender who is in probation program and is doing restorative justice project, which normally, most of the time, they get in positive way, and we don't have so much residue if they were good. But some of them, well, most of them, are also sons of daughter of people who are in detention already, and they have the 41 bis, which is the mafia association crime. So if you have a 41 bis, you are not allowed to have public places, you are not allowed to have concourse, you are not allowed to go even in military service. And so I have a young offender with the probation program finished in poverty way, which normally your paper are clean after all, who want to go in military service and maybe even go to police after, which is big things. But he can't achieve to that because his father, he has 41 bits. So my question is, it's not transmitted by blood, right? <laughs> so and also because they are young offenders too and we work for them, if we want to say that this is a positive consequence, this law shouldn't even exist. Or as you said, we should examine case by case because otherwise what I do with young offenders is just useless. So what do you think about this? And then I have another question too. It's uh, <laughs> which kind of role as the civil society in a probation and a restorative, uh, restorative justice project during the probation program and after. But I'm not talking only about civil society in considering the area where they live, but civil society consider them as European citizen. So which kind of role has got Europe in someone who is in probation in Italy or someone who is in probation in France or whatever? Because what I'm trying to do is like, I'm trying to make European project to get involve guys who are in probation to a project who is in France or is in America, not America, but far away. But which kind of role has got civil society and responsibility to these people? Thank you. Uh, first, first, first of all, um, yeah, uh, perfect remarks, but also very difficult ones and uh, very complicated ones. And uh, uh, I'm far for sure, from sure that I can um, um, come up with a, a sort of a reasonable uh, answer. But to start with uh, the first, uh, can I say, example that you gave, and that, that's it's uh, perhaps not so much. Uh, important from the penological uh, perspective, but certainly from the uh, criminological and developmental uh, perspective. Uh, we all know, especially those who are active uh, and in practice and in policy and in research in, uh, in juveniles and juvenile justice, that we have to pay attention to what exactly is the role of the parents. 
and you said something like uh, it's not passed on uh, by blood although I would not uh, underestimate uh, the importance of what we sometimes call the um, uh, the intergenerational transfer of well problematic behavior penal attitudes etc so that is imp indeed an important one but it also shows that if you are dealing with young people that have come into problems uh, with the law that one way or another you should have you should try to involve parents uh, th that is indeed very uh, very uh, important but also very difficult because the example you gave uh, as I understand it those parents or at least one of the parents is heavily seriously involved in the kind of behavior that we do not want and that's also where it, what was it 41 beats or whatever uh, is uh, is applied so that complicates it enormously and what does it mean that how should we deal with the youngsters and um, uh, it is uh, I don't think it's a good idea to sort of leave the parents completely out but I think that the answer the solution is to be found exactly what you said yourself is that we should have we should come up with tailor-made solutions and that we should be able in individual cases to I don't know to bend the rules in order to uh, at least give uh, proper perspectives uh, to the young persons and, you know and it's also a matter of priority what what do we find more important well I in my opinion um, young people go first and if it's needed to uh, to uh, bend rules and to uh, in order to uh, uh, act in a tailor-made way then we should do that but if it's legislation what is sort of uh, in, in front of it yeah that's a difficult one and then even well perhaps uh, there are some perhaps some possibilities to uh, to deal that with that in the other way that well the, the civil society well perhaps uh, Jan would like to say something about it but I'm pretty sure that there are also uh, people in the audience uh, who have the, their ideas about that because it is an important issue and especially at an event uh, as this one okay I can have a go uh, at the first one uh, the first question is um, well, I know that it's normally it's it's uh, more politically correct to be uh, very evasive about it. But uh, my personal view is that in most countries, the criminal record policy is not uh, a facilitator for the for the pres for the ex offenders to become uh, a better person, to become a citizen, to become a new person, a non-criminal, let's say. Uh, from many, for, for many reasons. Because uh, first, it's, it's, it is about the access on, on the employment, uh, on the, the labor market. The second is, is about the, uh, uh, the help for creating a new identity, a non-criminal identity. So for many reasons, the criminal record in many European countries is not facilitating, but uh, uh, it's a main obstacle for, the, for, for offenders to uh, stay in the criminal activity. I know that there are some uh, uh, initiatives in Ireland. Uh, I, I, I like the system in, in France where they have three different bulletins when uh, a criminal record is required by an employer. So a bulletin is available, a certain type of bulletin is available depending on the type of job you apply. So I see that there are some improvements, but it's not enough. In most countries, there is only one type of criminal record that is required and available for ex-prisoners to produce for the employers and this is all, uh, most of the time shows the, the conviction that you had in the past let's say five or ten years depending on the offense that you had and so on and this is really very very difficult going back to your uh, concrete question I think um, this is another example of how the uh, legislation can have a, an unintended effect because this sort of legislation can prevent uh, a, a youth, a, a, a juvenile, to become a, a non-criminal and to start a new life and to have a, a non-criminal identity because of uh, not only of his past but because of his family heritage. So it has to be open. He served the sentence. He was rehabilitated. He should. He has the right for a 
for a new start. And I like the, the German uh, um, Constitutional Court uh, uh, decision saying that there is a right for rehabilitation. And I think we, we should learn from this example. And we should allow people to be rehabilitated and then to give them chances to practice this new identity. So it should be on a case-by-case -case, uh, uh, decision. Uh, if the person looks at uh, the father as a role model and so on, maybe a little bit of caution is, uh, is needed. But if, if, the per if the juvenile has a different kind of life option, options, uh, a different sort of identity, different, sort of, different set of aspirations and so on, why should we prevent the juvenile to enter this kind of jobs? That's the first one. The second one about the, the communities and the, the, the role of uh, civil society, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting one because uh, probation started in, uh, um, in Europe as a voluntary initiative. In most countries, in, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Norway, in all these countries, they started as, an, as NGOs trying to help people become better. But increasingly, once we professionalized the field, we structured it, the volunteers are not so, so much welcome in, uh, in, in this field. And this is, this is not a very good move, I think. And uh, I think we can learn a lot from, uh, from Japan, where they have 50,000 volunteers working uh, for probation uh, service or together with probation service. So I think there is a role of the civil society, a role of volunteers uh, in working with offenders in prison and outside prison and in the probation world. But we have to find a way how to do it in a, in a kind of concrete way. We have models and we had, we had a history on that. So we can learn from our own experience if not from others' experience. Thanks. I'm sure that uh, there are some people who want to ask more questions. Please. Jürgen Hilmer, uh, Ministry of Justice, Bremen, Germany. So Peter von der Laan mentioned this one study from North Rhine-Westphalia, and I want only to make clear that the data are quite similar what you said uh, about these interesting uh, prison project here in the Netherlands, uh, or your neighbor country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, anyway, um, these one data, um, they are quite important to see. So w I'm just coming from a conference on the national level in Germany where we compared these data. Yeah? And so is it seeable that uh, 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 this one study had a huge impact in Germany on the transition management of offenders, and so the so-called Übergangsmanagement is so the, uh, uh, um, one of the impact what reduced the prison population drastically in Germany, and um, um, in regarding the recidivism rate, it was mentioned that um, these 80 percent was training um, in prison uh, um, uh, had recidivism for 80 percent um, compared with 90 percent if you do nothing with them. So, and this is substantially better if you give them support, including probation officer or NGOs or whatever, uh, um, the social welfare system. Um, so, and this is reducing to, uh, with uh, 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 um, uh, training to 30 uh, percent or 40 percent if you are able to place him directly in a correct yeah. cor job. Uh, so, so only in this one, this one circumstance. So I only want to add this. Yeah. Uh, John Scott from the United Kingdom, uh, for today at least. Um, <laughs> I wanted to pick up and extend the civic society aspects of um, working with offenders. And I'd want to ask the panel uh, whether they think that uh, partnerships with civil organizations, voluntary groups, rather than just using individuals and mentors, is important in reintegration. Okay. 
Well, I think there is a role to play for um, um, everybody, really. Um, but I think that uh, even the mentors, although they look as they are individuals, they also need to be organized. They also need to be supported and uh, trained to become to, to, to be effective on, in what they do. So behind every individual should be an organization uh, that can organize the process of uh, community involvement. Um, so it's not just a simple individual initiative. It's more than that. And support is really needed for these people to be, to, to be able to provide the help that they are, they are expected to provide. Please. Peter, maybe no, 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 no. Okay. Yeah. Um, in the Netherlands, we uh, I'm working on a project in in uh, one of the cities in The Hague, where they work with uh, mentors and also social workers from the same um, non-Western uh, background as the offenders, and it's an aftercare project for. Uh, youngsters between 17 and 27 who, whom they want to reintegrate and uh, uh, the f yeah, first results are really positive and they want to uh, spread that and I, I missed a little bit and you cannot touch upon everything of course but this, this research in uh, also different cultural backgrounds and how to work with that and uh, now also that these mentoring projects uh, that's again what John said and what you just mentioned that it's important that it's uh, uh, a solid organization behind that uh, to really set that up that's just one thing to add and then a question for Peter this uh, with these aftercare projects you said that uh, it's it was not working so well for the really young ones who yeah. are released and a bit better for the older ones can you just explain why um well what we'll to start with the letter that is uh, uh it's perhaps a bit difficult to explain but i believe because we do not have very strong indicators for that that there is a relationship between age and the seriousness of problems and backgrounds. And the younger you are, the, the smaller your problems are, so to say. That does not mean that there are no risks, but the problems are smaller. And we have to be very careful when dealing with, uh, with people, with offenders, uh, that we do not uh, want to do too much for those that not really need it. And, um, we know in many countries of all kinds of programs for uh, low-risk uh, offenders, very often the younger ones, when we come up with a whole range of activities, which is simply too much. And it is sort of with a sort of completely uh, uh, opposite outcome than what we expected from it. So in this uh, particular case, uh, it has certainly to do with uh, the seriousness and the background uh, of background and problems of these very young kids, and that it would be much better so almost like to leave them, you know, and that it's simply enough to uh, give them a rather simple uh, warning. If I can just come back to uh, John's question about uh, involving, well, so what should I say, uh, non-official, non-governmental organizations in dealing with people like offenders, etc. Uh, I think it is very much, very indeed, indeed, very important. However, uh, I would be a bit careful about thinking that it, this can be organized at a sort of a national level. I think that the most important uh, 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 characteristic of such successful enterprises is very often that it is organized at a very local level, where people know each other, where people uh, from organizations, including the probation service and the prison service, know the people from, for instance, the private industry that are so important to, uh, to provide jobs, where they know all kinds of social organizations that can play a role one way or another, be it, for instance, organizations with the same uh, non-Western uh, uh, background or the churches or uh, whatsoever. And you cannot organize that at a national level. We have uh, in the Netherlands uh, also examples of uh, organizations of volunteers that uh, uh, keep on visiting offenders if, uh, and, and prisoners, even those who have lifelong uh, sentences. They keep on uh, doing that. You can't organize that uh, top-down. It can also only be organized uh, 
uh, bottom up. And that's uh, where uh, perhaps also at this local level, uh, the community as a whole is so uh, very uh, important. So a lot can be expected from it, but I think you should organize it, uh, well, locally or regionally, if I can say. Mm -hmm. Uh, just, just to add something, uh, Peter. Yeah, this is this is what I want to to, to say is that I'm 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 involved in an, in another network uh, on active inclusion, uh, which deals with the employment and employability uh, for vulnerable groups, and uh, what we discovered in this network was that uh, it's very important uh, that these initiatives are organised locally, uh, are implemented locally, but they should be part of national policies or strategies because they need to be supported by institutions and legislation from all levels. So they should be delivered locally maybe, but they should be part of a wider kind of strategy or policy of community involvement. Thanks, Peter. Please. Well, Peter, Peter van der Sande, board member of Europe, please. I'm, happy, I'm very happy with the, the, the uh, emphasis on the role of society because I think that's what we missed during the last period because we do a lot of things for prisoners and, and, and offenders and, but as long as people in society don't want an ex-prisoner next uh, living to him as long as employers don't want to give ex-prisoner job, a job we will not get a safe society and and offenders will fall back in, uh, in, uh, in criminality. But what we can arrange on a national level, because uh, I agree with the activities on the local level, but what you see in every country, the people in society has a very, very wrong image of what's going on in prisons. Also in probation. Uh, and I think it's the task of the, on the national level, maybe the government or the prison service organization, to communicate better <laughs> about the things they are doing in their organization because uh, for example in the Netherlands we years ago we started with an open day in prison people f from society could uh, off be offered the opportunity to enter the prison and to see what's going on happening in prison and nearly 90 percent has an has a wrong image of prison before entering prison and after seeing what was going on nearly all of them uh, has another another opinion. I think that's what we have to do bec because otherwise we will keep stigmatizing expressiveness and that will not help us to reintegrate that, uh, that people. So that's very important. Uh, I have an, a, a question to Peter because uh, uh, I'm very happy with this research. We, we already spoke about the importance of research for our organization. But at the same time, I'm a little bit astonished by the fact that this is the first research uh, in this field. We, we lock up people for more than 100 years and we don't know what the consequences are of our decisions. So have you an explanation for, for that? <laughs> well, um, in a way I have uh, and it has to do with the system as such. And uh, I, I'm absolutely uh, convinced that this goes for many, many countries, that for ages, centuries perhaps even, we were quite happy to have, for instance, prisons, and that the only thing that we were uh, concerned about it was that we could lock them up and that we wouldn't see them for quite a while. And for some reason, uh, perhaps the retribution aspect was the most important, and that that, uh, uh, well, sort of fulfilled our needs. And uh, I remember, and it must be in the, uh, the late 1980s or early 1990s, that for the first time, politicians started to ask for what comes out of it. What do we know about uh, reoffending figures of people that have been uh, convicted uh, by the court? Those questions were never asked before. And I would argue that uh, when we started introducing all kinds of alternatives, that it was the first time that also researchers 
uh, were receiving the question, how are those who uh, have to perform community service orders, how are they doing compared to those who have been uh, detained? But never before that. And uh, uh, researchers, because they have also uh, an interest in research, uh, but I would say that they always have been more interested in trying to explain behavior, including offending uh, behavior, and that they indeed were less interested in outcomes of all kinds of interventions, though there have been wonderful studies uh, about prison life and about what was going on in probation. But in terms of effectiveness, this whole concept of evidence-based interventions is absolutely a very, very recent one. So uh, we were simply not interested as long as they were locked up. It was okay. It's, well, I mean, this is a sort of uh, almost anecdotal kind of uh, uh, explanation, but I, I think that's it. Thank you very much. I think that we have room for a very, very final last question from the audience. <laughs> Hi, um, this on? Yeah. Uh, my name is Alex Tinsley. I'm from Fair Trials uh, Europe, um, which is related to Fair Trials International. Um, my question relates to the pre-trial stage of criminal proceedings and the use of, of detention or alternatives to detention uh, pre-trial, pre-conviction. One is a really simple factual question about uh, your study um, on the outcomes of detention, whether this also covers the outcomes of detention of people detained pre-trial because building this evidence of the massive human and social cost of pre-trial detention is an important thing in persuading the European Union uh, to adopt measures to encourage the use of alternatives pre-trial. So I hope that that information is available. I'd really like to, to know how it breaks down. Um, and the second thing I wanted to ask was about I'm not quite sure what this question is that I've written down, but um, <laughs> I guess uh, there's a, a colleague in, uh, who works at a probation sort of pre-trial supervision organization in Paris called APCAS who, who do really amazing work. And he was saying in a, a meeting we had on pre-trial detention that if um, needs, um, like supervision needs are identified during the pre-trial stage and that sensible propositions are put in front of the judge who's responsible for pre-trial detention decision making, um, and they see that you know people undergo drug programs or you know um, uh, comply with requirement probation type requirements pre-trial, then they're less likely to be given a custodial sentence and more likely to be given uh, sensible probation type um, you know measures as uh, when, as and when they're convicted if they are convicted. And um, that there's a sort of useful linkage there in making the whole criminal process more effective at reducing rehabilitation. So I just wonder if you have observations on that linkage between pre- and post-trial stages. And also, finally, um, I don't know if I missed something this morning because I, I was late, but um, people have mentioned a couple of times the framework decisions, um, 829, 909, 947. Um, we look all the time for examples of these being used in practice. As far as I'm aware, um, the European Supervision Order framework decision has been used once. I have one concrete example that I'm aware of in the whole European Union. Uh, it should have been implemented a year and a half ago now. So like, um, I just wonder if you have experiences of uh, these framework decisions being used. I mean, 909 is a different case, but particularly 947, and what kinds of challenges arise um, in that context. Thank you. Well, I'm told to be uh, brief. So your first question about the design of our project. We decided to uh, follow people that were entering prison or remand. So the large, well, all of them, when they entered the remand center, they also entered our research project, they were on remand in pretrial uh, detention, knowing that uh, periods of detention are relatively short in the Netherlands. Uh, you can uh, believe me saying that uh, the large majority of these people in our cohort were in pretrial detention only, because by the time they had to appear before the court, they received a penalty which was sort of 
almost sort of compensating for the period of time in pretrial uh, detention. Yeah, well, it, it, it depends how you put it. It also shows that the outcomes of, the, of our project, of our research, is very much about pretrial detention and about the outcomes and impact of pretrial detention. So that's the interesting uh, uh, part of that. Then um, there is certainly um, uh, uh, internationally uh, more uh, acceptance for coming up as soon as possible with alternatives for pretrial detention. And I'm pretty much convinced that many magistrates would welcome that. But there's an important thing that, that has to be met, and that is someone has to come up with this idea, with this alternative, why uh, pretrial detention should be uh, as limited as, uh, as possible. And, uh, uh, and such a suggestion won't come from the police, won't come from the public prosecutor's <coughs> office, or, and therefore should come from other organizations, the probation service in particular. And if there are problems in uh, informing the probation service about people being arrested and being put into pretrial de detention, then you cannot expect from the probation service that they come up with an idea, you know, we are going to work uh, with this guy or this uh, woman, and therefore they stay longer than necessary in pretrial detention. And I'm afraid to say that with regard to pretrial detention, the Netherlands is not the best example because uh, the, the numbers of people in pretrial detention are huge, are really huge. And then the framework uh, question, I would like to leave that to, to others who are more uh, uh, expert in that area. Okay, I, will, I would like to, to say something about the, the pretrial thing, and uh, you are right, we have enough evidence to show that uh, indeed those who are uh, on trial under pretrial detention, they are more likely to, to receive in the end a custodial sentence. We have evidence for that. Uh, and it seems to be a big issue, especially for foreign offenders, foreigners. And I know that uh, Fair Trial International is very concerned with this situation, and uh, probably the pretrial practice for foreign offenders it's, um, can explain the huge uh, rates of imprisonment for uh, foreigners across uh, Europe, but it's something that we need to discuss. About the framework decisions, uh, it's it's uh, true, it's very difficult. Not all the countries transpose the, the framework decisions, not all of them. It's, um, uh, we are still late in, uh, in the implementation. We don't have so many cases. We have some cases, but some of them are uh, based on the Europe, uh, Council of Europe uh, Convention, not on the framework decisions, but we can still learn from them and see the, what the obstacles might be and so on. There are some projects going on financed by the co-financed by the Commission on this issue and hopefully by the end of this year we will be able to tell you more about that. We, I can tell you that we involve already the, 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 the end users. We interview the prisoners, we interview the probationers to see how they would react with this opportunity, if they will fight it or not and, uh, and so on. So I, I hope by the end of this year we will have a clearer picture about uh, why these framework decisions are not uh, implemented so well so far. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, to all of you. I think that uh, we took the right decision just to plan to have a lunch together because I'm sure that during this time we have uh, the opportunity to talk to each other and to finish uh, some of the questions that for sure will arise at, at that moment. Uh, it is clear for me that uh, it was a very fruitful session. Thank you very much you for being here. And, and, I, and I think that from this session, and very briefly, we take a clear message that there is a need for reinforcing the concept of a common criminal policy in Europe, that research has a lot to say in this respect, and maybe taken into consideration. And we are happy to see that the criminal justice platform may help in this process. So uh, at least my uh, reflection after this session is that there is room for going f uh, farther together, and I'm sure that we can follow the road. Thank you very much, and I turn over uh, to Michael as a chair of the session just for closing this one.